Well, thank you very much. I'll see if I can do it just in a few minutes, um, because I think everybody is, uh, wants to get up and move around. Um, the first point I want to make is that um, if we are talking about governing a healthy city, there really is, um, we, we have to have a clear principle that it's got to be people-based, which means that decision-making and policies should be focused on how it impacts on people. Now, this is easy to say and much harder to do, but I think it's important to just bear this in mind. A healthy city, healthy for whom? Healthy for people. Secondly is um, we've spent a lot of time talking about infrastructure and the urban form. This is a culmination of the political economy, land use, ownership, what development means in that city, and that generates uh, density and creates a certain sense of well-being or stress. It's unavoidable to talk about the politics, which is why I think uh, we've ended up a good part of this afternoon about that. I suspect if we take any city, we, we need to ask a number of questions about the assumptions behind the economy of that city. And let me just use Hong Kong as a point of reflection, and perhaps for those of you who come from other cities, you see if, uh, if you ask the same question about your city, what answer you would get. Our friend from SoCo was asked a question by, uh, by a gentleman, uh, well, what, you know, why, why haven't Hong Kong done certain things? Now, let's just put out a number of facts and then let's reflect on why that might be so. You're absolutely right, Hong Kong is tremendously wealthy. For this current year, we have a nine billion US dollar surplus. This is the government budget. And they expect for the next five years, we should have a um, similar amount, okay? If the economy, world economy goes into a nosedive, that might be affected. But there's one piece of information where it uh, didn't come out in this discussion, which is why does Hong Kong have so much money to build hardware infrastructure? You've probably, uh, well, you, you, you saw um, uh, Secretary Lam's presentation, w we are, changing the face of the city all the time. We have a, a, a West Kowloon Cultural Center coming up that is being designed by Norman Foster. Uh, Mrs. Lamb told us about uh, where the old airport was and you know how we're gonna transform this into a cruise terminal and uh, private housing and, and new commercial center. And then she showed us other places around Hong Kong where tremendous things are gonna take place. She also said, whilst we're not going to reclaim in the harbor anymore, we are going to reclaim. So if you just count all those things up, well, where's the money coming from? Who's gonna pay for that? Now in Hong Kong, what we do is, when, whenever we sell land, when we say making land available, right? All the private housing, they will have to go and pay and buy the land or change land use. And every time you change land use in Hong Kong, you pay something called land premium, which means you have to pay a lot of money up front. Now, what happens here is that money does not go into general government revenue. That money doesn't go into paying for education or cleaning up the environment or healthcare for that matter. That money is put into a special account just to pour concrete. So that's why Hong Kong perhaps is a unique case where we continuously have money year after year to invest in hardware. Now, if, if you look at the government budget, you'd say, well, well, where's the money going into the software, you know, the health services, cleaning up the environment, even education? It's not like we're not investing in those areas, but when you compare it to the billions and billions that we put into hardware infrastructure, it is kind of a poor cousin. Now, with that in mind, we, we can say, well, have we underinvested in certain things? And why do our government official, generation after generation, prefer a hardware model? Now, it probably has to do with that uh, our young, you know, our current generation of leaders, um, they, they made their name, they cut their teeth at a time when Hong Kong had to pour a lot of concrete. So this became the development model. So that's why we are fearful that if we do not build a third runway to our airport, uh, the Hong Kong's gonna be finished. If we don't build another highway, another tunnel uh, that connects us with the mainland, 
and, and, and you know, the airport connecting us to ever more people around the world, that Hong Kong would be over. Now, I'm sure many of you recognize that this is probably the kind of fear that uh, officials, politicians have all around the world. And nobody, no city, no government, no political party around the world has yet come up with a vision that they believe is compelling. A vision about investing in the softer side of things. You know, can we imagine that growth and development and prosperity and well-being can come through another form of community investment? Now, of course, there are many cities around the world where they should have invested in sanitation. They should have provided public toilets. But these were clearly not the priority, which is why they're not there. So when we ask the question, why weren't they the priority? I think it's not just a matter of saying, do you have a, a democratic system or not? Or, you know, uh, is there corruption? Perhaps a, a deeper question is to say, what is in the minds of the elites who are making these decisions about what they think is good for their communities? The, the other question I want to ask then is, how do we share the wealth of the community? Um, now, when we see the kind of deprivation we, we have in Hong Kong, in a very, very wel wealthy city, well, it's always painful for any, any community uh, amongst the elites, actually, to talk about sharing of wealth. Let's just look at, uh, at Hong Kong. Uh, as uh, our friend from Soko said, we, our uh, average income per month, household income, is about $17,500. Um, actually, that's the same as it was in 1999. So it means that for 12 years, we've been frozen. Yet our economy has grown by 55%. And yet, productivity has grown on average 4% a year. So something is not working. But we're not having in our community this kind of discussion. People are afraid to have this kind of discussion. And also, I think the political elites and the business elites are uncomfortable with this kind of discussion because they worry that it's going to be very conflictual. It's going to be violent. So we don't end up having a way to have these conversations. So I just want to end what, what, uh, uh, what I want to say by referring to something that uh, uh, Professor Argyle said. He kind of laid out uh, a model for how we need to have uh, connected decision making. And I think uh, other experts had talked about relational decision making. How do we make the right kind of policy interventions both today and yesterday? To do some of those things, I think we need to think about the processes of creating conversations on the ground. The work from many of you, and they are, they are, they are the world leading works, um, but perhaps even that does not adequately inform decision makers, whether in public or the private sector, in your own community. And I think we need to ask why. Why those things are not being used. And in my community, I'd like to think, well, how can we build the kind of cross-discipline conversations informed by the hard and the soft sciences where we can produce the visuals that will move certain decision makers that we also need to take them on walkabouts so that they can see as, as uh, uh, Edgar was saying, uh, uh, and Ricky, you went to Cape Town and you did, they didn't want to see. So this, this blindness that the elites have and even people who are governing can only be cured if they could be brought to see. So how can we create the kind of conversation that clearly has the evidence, that clearly is it, where, where we're able to see, and then we design the conversations which are not hurried. The other thing about political the political timetable is we don't have time. You know, we make decisions. We just got to get on with it. If you propose something that will take uh, uh, maybe a year or so to have deep conversation within the community, many many politicians would say this is taking too long. It's going to cost money. Who's going to pay for it? And then you know, when conversation don't seems to go well deci because decisions are not being made, then people say, well, you know, this is a waste of time. So I think we need to also 
um, perhaps put the kind of uh, tools, the language of tools and processes, um, uh, because commercial and political decision makers need them. Uh, and perhaps the lesson for those of us who are in research is how can we package them in a way that actually makes it easier to communicate also with those people who are making the decisions. Th that mm -hmm. sort of thing. And better, right? And even better. Um, it's, worth, it's worth spending time to think about the conversation that must take place across sectors and on the ground with community is unfortunately going to take time and effort and commitment from both the public and the private sector to be willing to fund and sustain it. Okay, thank you. <laughs>